Well, good morning, Selby United Church, and welcome to this time of worship for February 13th, 2022. Today we're in Tamworth, another beautiful mill town along the Salmon River. But it wasn't until the Irish potato famine of the mid-19th century that this hamlet really came to life. Hundreds of Irish immigrants made their way to this area in search of affordable land on which to restart their lives. But this rough and tumble influx of people made for an interesting mix in this already established community. Local politics provided a great diversion, from, and from time to time things could get a bit out of hand. On more than one occasion there were reports of riotous mobs and chases through town. Well, today we're continuing in our story about David, who is being chased by King Saul. And it is at this time that David writes, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. So the sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass, whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Let's sing together. Well, I mentioned that this neck of the woods has a pretty storied past. One incident during the construction of the railway resulted in a riot on the streets of Tamworth. The problem came in October of 1884 when a railway contractor failed to pay 65 Italian laborers who had been shoring up ties and rails. When they weren't paid, the navies tied up the company's agent and dried, tried to drag him back to their camp. He escaped and was chased through the streets of town, where he was rescued by local citizens armed with clubs and swords. The local militia was even called out. Two men were shot and two were stabbed in the chase, but thankfully no one was killed. Twenty men were arrested and sent by train to Napanee Jail for the night. They were released the next day and then paid $200 in damages. Well, this morning we continue to hear about a, a pursuit of a different kind. Today the tables will turn as Saul finds himself in a precarious situation in a cave in the wilderness of En Gedi, and David is in the perfect position to get some revenge. Will he? Well, it's another test of his character. And so let's begin our time of worship this morning with prayer. O Lord, our protector and our sustainer, it is good to find our strength in you. We call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised this morning, and we ask that you will send your spirit that we might encounter your word for us, and we might truly hear and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, now it's time for our special music, and here's Jane Hughes singing, Jesus, Take All of Me. Jesus. 
just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thy will receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promises I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. me just as I am. You love me. Just as I am broken in two, just as I am, I come to you because I know your word is true, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Well, just over my shoulder here is the old hotel, and you can see that it's been here for a while. Well, I'm so glad that our amazing Sunday School teacher, Mallory Wyonzik, is going to lead our theme time this morning. Our kids sure have missed our, their weekly opportunity to be together, and we look forward to doing that again in a couple of weeks. So here's Mallory. My family and I love playing board games, and the game of life is one of our favorites. But what happens when someone breaks the rules while you're playing? People accuse them of doing something wrong. It's sort of like your conscience, that little voice inside your head. God creates rules for life, and when we break those rules, our conscience accuses us. But unlike our angry family and friends, God doesn't quit playing the game and give up on us. Instead, if we ask him, he'll forgive us, restore us, and even makes a way for us to go on to win the game. He even gives us a helper, the Holy Spirit, so that we can get really good at playing the game. So the next time you hear that little voice inside your head telling you you're doing something wrong, listen and ask God to show you the right way. Thanks, Mallory. And now let's sing together, Your Love Awakens Me. There were walls between us By the cross you came and broke them down You broke them down There were chains around we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Feel the 
darkness shaking All the dead are coming back to life I'm back to life Hear the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive You called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name And then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Well, today is the seventh week of our sermon series called Character Under Construction, where we're looking at the Old Testament book called 1 Samuel and the character named David to think about what Christian character is and how we can develop it in our own lives. This week, we will see David still on the run, encountering Saul in a cave in a moment of weakness. David we must decide what to do next. So let's listen to the Word of God, which comes to us today through the voice of Carly Ewens. Today I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. When Saul got back from fighting off the Philistines, he heard that David was in the desert around Gedi. Saul led 3,000 of Israel's best soldiers out to look for David and his men near wild goat rocks in Gedi. There were some sheep pens along the side of the road, and one of them was built around the entrance to a cave. Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. David and his men were hiding at the back of the cave. They whispered to David, The Lord told you he was going to let you defeat your enemies and do whatever you want with them. This must be the day the Lord was talking about. David sneaked over and cut off a small piece of Saul's robe, but Saul didn't notice a thing. Afterwards, David was sorry that he had even done that, and he told his men, Stop talking foolishly. We're not going to attack Saul. He's my king. I pray the Lord will keep me from doing anything to harm his chosen king. Saul left the cave and started down the road. Soon, David also got up and left the cave. Your majesty, he shouted from a distance. Saul turned around to look. David bowed down very low and said, Your majesty, why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you? You can see for yourself that the Lord gave me the chance to catch you in the cave today. Some of my men wanted to kill you, but I wouldn't let them do it. I told them, I will not harm the Lord's chosen king. Your majesty, look at what I'm holding. You can see it's a piece of your robe, and if I could cut off a piece of your robe, I could have killed you, but I let you live, and that should prove I'm not trying to harm you. Or to rebel, I haven't done anything to you, and yet you keep trying to ambush and kill me. I'll let the Lord decide which one of us has done right. I pray that the Lord will punish you for what you're doing to me, but I won't do anything to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Carly. And now, let us pray. O oh Lord, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I remember back when I was in sales and had a big meeting with an organization's top brass, my sales manager gave me some advice. Just remember, he said, these guys put their pants on one leg at a time, too. It's a bit of an odd thought, but strangely, I found it helpful. When encountering people who wield power and decision-making authority, we can sometimes turn them into more than they really are. It's helpful to keep in mind that they are humans with the same kind of limitations as everyone else. Well, today, perhaps chapter 24 of 1 Samuel offers us a similar insight. Just remember, even kings go to the bathroom. This morning, David and his crew happen to be hiding out in the back of the very same cave that Saul decides to use as his restroom. Remember, King Saul has been hunting David at every turn, making life quite difficult. But even so, by God's providence, David has been protected at every turn too. Saul's rule and reign has brought about some real harm to the nation Israel and to David and his men in particular. And now is their chance to get even. They couldn't have arranged it better themselves. It was a perfect setup. By luck or, or divine providence, Saul has been delivered into their hands. 
Or has he? Could this be yet another test along the way, another metric to measure how David's character building construction project is going? Vengeance, the way that we get even with those who do us wrong. We learn this early on. Your little sister hits you, you hit her back. But the lessons carry on later in life too. But there's one problem, one inconvenient truth. Scripture tells us, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so David creeps up behind Saul while he's indisposed in the darkness of the cave. But instead of taking Saul's life, he takes the corner of his robe. Now, this is not as insignificant as it sounds. Remember, the royal robe is a deeply symbolic garment. We saw this with Jonathan back in chapter 18 when he gave David his robe and his sword, symbolizing the giving of his authority and his power. And so when David cuts Saul's robe, he is making a powerful symbolic gesture about who is really worthy to be king. So how has David done this morning? Would you say that he gets a gold star for character? Well, maybe, but the text says the strangest thing. It says, afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. Sure, David didn't kill Saul, which is clearly a sin and counter to God's law. But did he do the right thing? Was Saul's robe really his to cut? After all, David knows that Saul, too, was God's anointed. And until God brings about a regime change, he still is God's appointed king over Israel. What is our conscience, and what role should it play in the character of a Christian? Well, for us, influenced by the thinking of 20th century psychologists like Sigmund Freud, we might believe that the, the conscience is nothing more than the internalized voice of your father. It's your hang-ups, your inherited prejudices, and cultural influences. And maybe there is some truth there, but I don't think that's the whole story. The conscience is far too powerful to simply be dismissed as hang-ups and repressions. No, the conscience connects us with something that is beyond ourselves. It connects us with the external order of what is good and what is not good, what theologians call the natural law. Catholic thinker John Henry, Henry Newman once wrote that the, the conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ in the soul. He says the conscience is the voice of God. It is a messenger from him who both in nature and in grace speaks to us behind a veil and teaches and rules us by his representatives. The scripture tells us that every person has the law of God written on their hearts. We have a sense of right and wrong imprinted in us, which then acts as a, a mechanism to guide our choices. And when we act against God's law, it causes us to have deep feelings of, of dread, anxiety, and sometimes even self-loathing. Like physical pain, which tells you something is wrong, your conscience is like moral pain, which tells you when you are heading down a bad road. But, you might say, aren't our consciences different from one person to another based on our life experiences? Well, to some degree, yes, that's true. While most everyone's conscience will agree that murder is wrong, adultery is bad, and stealing is a sin, we may differ on other matters of conscience. We might not agree about whether it's okay to watch R-rated movies or whether swearing is bad, drinking is acceptable, or tattoos are a good idea. One person's conscience might prevent them from doing these things while another person's may not. Why is that? Well, it seems that the conscience can be influenced by our experiences. An overbearing parent, for example, might cause us to have a, a conscience that runs on overdrive. Some people's conscience is so overbearing that they turn to drugs or extreme activities to try to escape it. On the other hand, a similar experience in a different person might undermine the proper functioning of the conscience and drive them to abandon all sense of right and wrong. In short, the conscience can be tampered with. God's law, written in our heart, can be replaced by creating a kind of alternative law. And you can confuse your conscience by telling yourself that your situation is unique and the old ways are outdated, outmoded, even wrong. We live in a world that is constantly trying to have its way with our internal compass. The news channels we watch, the entertainment we consume is never value neutral. People sometimes say they don't want to impose religion on their children. I find that oddly inconsistent because they allow their kids to watch all other kinds of value-laden things that uh, have their way with them. 
So how do we know if our consciences are functioning properly, that is, as God intends them? Well, you won't be surprised to hear that it is, in, that it is Scripture that can act as the corrective lenses for our conscience. Paul says Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I recently watched a podcast by a very thoughtful Christian named Mike Winger. Brought up in a conservative Christian tradition, he always thought that drinking was a sin. So he never did it, and he looked down on those who did. That is until he undertook an exhaustive study of Scripture in later life and found that it actually isn't a sin. In fact, in Scripture, wine is a symbol of the abundance of the kingdom of God. What is a sin is drunkenness and other outcomes of overconsuming. So Pastor Mike changed his mind. Interestingly, he still chose not to drink for a variety of other reasons. I've come to think of Scripture's function as kind of like a massive soundboard for mixing various instruments and voices, kind of like the one we have at church. As we read Scripture, we begin to set various levels in our own minds and hearts about what is good and what is bad. Scripture helps us to think through some of the nuances of life and address the complexities that we all face. But misuse Scripture or don't account for its complexity, and you can end up with a very distorted kind of sound as the output. I find so many Christians who have mined Scripture for what they want it to say rather than accepting what it does say have a very shrill Christian output. I find the things that they focus on and the way that they live out their faith almost unrecognizable as the way of Jesus Christ. Because the key is to weigh Scripture against itself. There are correctives in Scripture. There are paradoxes which teach us to hold on to two opposing truths at the same time. But through the millennia, Christians distorted certain aspects of morality, and the outcome is a very odd take on what it means to, to follow Jesus, to, to live a life of, of righteousness. I think of the Crusades of the 11th and 12th centuries, or the witch trials of the 17th century, as two horrendous examples of this. Neither could possibly be justified by the full body of the Word of God, but I guess take a few verses out of context and you're off to the races. But a fulsome view of God's word is a lifelong process of, of setting our dials and then, then resetting them as we come to know and appreciate God, the God who is full of grace and full of truth. And this is how we keep our consciences in good working order, by growing in the knowledge of who God is and who we are in relationship to God. A properly functioning conscience has two purposes in our everyday lives. The first thing the conscience does is it affirms us when we do something that's right even if others disagree with us. We can see that in our text this morning. David's conscience would not allow him to take Saul's life in that cave, even though his men thought that's exactly what he should do. David's conscience allowed him to block out the other voices and to hold firm to what he knew was right. The second function of a properly ordered conscience is to convict us when we've done wrong. And who hasn't experienced this? lying awake at night, tossing and turning, knowing that we've done the wrong thing. No one enjoys this aspect of our conscience, like the pain that we feel when we touch a hot stove element. It alerts us through pain to what is wrong. But we live in a cultural moment that can't make sense of pain. The dominant viewpoint is that the purpose of life is to maximize your pleasure and to minimize your pain. So anything that causes pain must be bad. Combine that with a total intolerance towards the feeling of guilt, and it's no wonder that we're willing to do just about anything to disconnect from our consciences. But the reality is that a fully functioning conscience is the key to good moral health and mental health. God has given us a conscience for a reason, and it is for our own benefit to flourish as humans and also to develop our character. I remember back in grade three, I got sent to the principal's office, my one and only time, for something a buddy and I did wrong. We went off a of school property at recess. That night, lying in bed, I agonized over what to do about it because I just felt terrible. I knew I'd done the wrong thing, and I certainly didn't want ever to go through that again. Finally, I decided to go downstairs and just tell my mom what had happened. She wasn't happy, of course, but I sure felt better getting that off my chest. This is how our consciences bring us into the fullness of health and well-being, because we do do things that are against God's will, and we don't know what to do about them. Our consciences not only convict us, but they drive us to action. 
As we have seen in our text from 1 Samuel this morning, David is driven to confront Saul and, and not to kill him. After his conscience does its work, he, he gives Saul the honor that he is due as king. Because of Saul's properly functioning conscience, this is a good news story to a, what, what could have been a potentially bad news, character-destroying story. But what do we do when we have done those wrong things, when our conscience wasn't firing on all cylinders? What do we do when we lie awake at night overcome by the guilt for what we have done? Listen to this thought from Walter Chantry, a Presbyterian pastor. He says, conscience is a friend to hurry you into the arms of the only Savior from the broken law and its curse. Conscience is a friend. And what does this friend do? He hurries you into the arms of Jesus. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in the letter to the Roman church. He says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The whole point of this verse is how good God is to people like us, people like us who sin daily, who distort the word of God in our hearts, and who think that we can pull it all together under our own steam only to mess it all up again. Now, you'd expect God to say something like, I gave you the Ten Commandments, now you know what to do, now do it and show me that you mean it. But God's actual answer to our sin is not the Ten Commandments and getting all up in our face about what we've done wrong, but God's answer is the Holy Spirit getting up in our hearts. That's what it says in Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation but the Spirit who gives life has set you free. And it is our conscience, this God-given gift for people like us, that ultimately drives us to recognize our need for a Savior. God is scanning the horizon this morning, listening for people who will finally admit that they can't do this on their own. How do we come to that conclusion? When the weight of our burden of failure becomes too much to bear, and we finally let down our guard and cry out for help. And then God comes. God comes on the wings of a dove, as the old hymn says, and enters into our hearts and says, let me bear this burden with you. Let me take your sins to my cross. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what's weighing on your conscience today? What past thoughts Words or deeds continue to weigh you down, even after all this time. Maybe this is something only God can deal with for you. All it takes is a prayer. Lord, have mercy on a sinner like me. And that's a prayer that Jesus is dying to answer. Thanks be to God. Amen.
mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly Well, this morning, we're so pleased to have Louise McKee leading us in our prayer time. So here's Louise. Good morning, everyone. Let's bow our heads in prayer together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning with deepest gratitude for your continued and numerous blessings. After several weeks of nasty wintry conditions, the sunny skies and milder temperatures have buoyed our spirits. And as the light of each day noticeably lengthens just a tad, we feel renewed hope in the promise of spring drawing closer. As the COVID restrictions are lessened once again, and as the previously staggering statistics start to improve gradually in this, as well as in neighboring regions, we offer our sincerest thanks once more that we have weathered another wave and that we can soon be thinking about resuming our in-person worship here in the Selby Sanctuary. We rejoice in simple pleasures, like our technology, which has allowed us to remain united in myriad ways during these prolonged times of mandated distancing our ability to openly profess our faith and to worship you when so many other Christians in various parts of our world cannot. The privilege to sing hymns, to read scriptures, to pray and to be prayed for, thinking specifically now of our prayer partners in the parishes of the Tyendinaga Anglican and Land O'Lakes Emmanuel United, and to minister to the needs of those within our families and community by being your church and offering provisions, prayers, company, and consolation to those we can readily assist. Lord, we bring to you now in silence the names of those individuals who are weighing on our hearts and minds this morning, asking that you show us even more ways in which we can be a blessing to them. Of course, our world is rife with troubles and problems, and not only abroad, but sadly, much closer to home these days, Lord Jesus. Neither can we discount ongoing battles with illness and disease, most especially the global pandemic, still wreaking havoc in more parts of the world than we care to acknowledge. And yet, as your children, we know with utmost certainty that your hand is at work in all of it, Father. Help us, Lord Jesus, to trust in your prevailing goodness in all circumstances, good or bad. Help us to sense your grace and your comfort and your wisdom in all things, so that we need not fear whatever lies before us. Teach us to wait expectantly in faith, knowing that your grace is sufficient at all times, as is promised in your holy word. We've heard Reverend Mike speak to us this morning about conscience, determining and directing how we should best behave as followers of Christ, and giving us reasons to turn to you frequently as our consciences react and respond to the demands of everyday living. Bless us, Heavenly Father, as we exercise and develop our conscience muscles. And as we close in prayer this morning, dear Lord, we ask that you continue to keep us close to you throughout the coming week, to replay and to revisit the components of this worship service in our minds and our hearts as we conduct our daily routines and business in the course of the next six days. Guide us, inspire us, 
and keep us functioning in good conscience as we go into the world as Christ's representatives and witnesses. And we pray all these things to your glory using the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Louise. Freely we have received and freely we give. It's now time for our offering. If you'd like to send your offering this morning to support the work and ministry of this church, you can do so by mail, by e-transfer, or by joining our automatic banking option called PAR. And so with much gratitude for your unwavering support of God's work in our community, I offer this blessing. These are the work of our hands and the love of our hearts. May they be a blessing to this community and the wider world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now it's time to join in our closing hymn. Let's sing together. Come, O fount of every blessing. I pray that our time together has been a blessing and nourishing for your soul. Just two reminders, on February 27th, we plan to return to in-person and live streamed services. We look forward to that. And also on March 27th, we plan to have our annual congregational meeting. We look forward to that too. And so looking forward to a God-filled week, go with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go now in peace. Amen.